see the title of this talk on the screen. Pardon, please. All right, so I, I apologize for the <coughs> change in the title. I meant to talk about uh, De Sitter space time in general, but um, I, in thinking about uh, putting together the talk, I wanted to talk a little bit about the origin story of De Sitter space time in uh, Einstein's thinking about cosmology and his uh, disputes with De Sitter of that era. And uh, I became more and more obsessed with uh, some questions about Einstein. Um, uh, not large-scale questions like people have been talking about, but fairly uh, uh, picky ones. Uh, and so I think the best thing for you to think is um, after this morning's deep-sea diving, it would be dangerous for you to come up to the surface too quickly. So this is to sort of uh, help, help to prevent you from getting the bends. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk about Einstein uh, on infinite space for a while, and then hopefully I'll have some time at the end uh, to talk about that monster, uh, namely De Sitter space. The section, the long section about Einstein and infinite space actually has uh, two main parts. Uh, it'll become clear in a second what they're going to be. So here's the context. In uh, 1917, when he was working on his cosmology paper, um, Einstein chose to write the paper in a sort of surprising way. Uh, the first half of the paper is concerned with a discussion of boundary conditions. Um, he sort of first argues uh, via these considerations about boundary conditions that space has to be finite. And then in the second half of the paper, he gives a static, uh, spatially compact dust cosmology uh, that doesn't satisfy his original field equations, so he proposes that the field equations be modified. Now, one thing that's interesting about this is he could have uh, uh, put the second half of the paper first or completely dropped out the first half. I mean, there is only one static dust cosmology. It's clear in the paper that he thinks it's of paramount importance to find a static cosmological solution to the field equations, and so he could have just focused on the second half. Furthermore, it's clear in his correspondence of that time that um, he's a little more nervous about the way this paper will be received than he... Uh, was about his other papers, and also that he doesn't expect his audience to find the boundary conditions considerations particularly compelling. So it's a little strange that he chooses to structure, chooses to structure the paper the way that he does, but it's also clear in his correspondence that he thinks it's tremendously important to lead people through these boundary considera conditions considerations because he set himself the goal of showing that the project of the theory of relativity can be thought through consistently all the way to the end, and he thinks that it's only uh, by, uh, via these boundary conditions considerations that he manages to do that. So he speaks repeatedly of uh, having achieved, what he's achieved in this paper is showing that relativity theory is consistent and coherent. So for him at least, these considerations were extremely important. So here's the basic argument against, against spatial infinitude that he gives in the paper. Uh, First premise, this is quoted from the first paragraph of the paper. We must supplement the differential equations of the theory by limiting conditions at spatial infinity if we really have to regard the universe as being of infinite spatial extent. Two, the most obvious way of supplementing the differential equations is by imposing asymptotic flatness at spatial infinity. Okay, so here, it's actually better not to think of spatial infinity as just a point, as it has been on the diagrams we've been looking at. It's better to think of it as a sort of hyperboloid at spatial infinity, so that for every space-like geodesic, you get a distinct endpoint. Or, that's not quite right, but you, you get a lot more endpoints than just a single point. Um, so the most obvious way of supplementing the field equations by boundary conditions is to impose asymptotic flatness at spatial infinity. Require uh, restrict attention to space-time metrics that become more and more like the Minkowski metric as you go out to infinity in certain directions. But, Einstein says, uh, asymptotic flatness has certain undesirable consequences. Namely, it violates general covariance, it violates Mach's principle, and there's no equilibrium for finite island universes in an asymptotically flat cosmology. And he thinks, although he doesn't have much of an argument, uh, that there are no other boundary conditions free from these defects or defects like them. So, 
uh, rather than live with such defects, we should abandon spatial infinitude and move to a spatially finite cosmology. And I think it's this uh, conclusion above all that he expects people to boggle at. Okay, so, I mean, the argument, I think, looking at it in contemporary terms isn't a great success. Right? It's not clear, really, what force the first premise has. Why do we need to add boundary conditions? Why can't we just consider all the solutions uh, on R4? Some of them will be asymptotically flat, some of them won't. I mean, why think of boundary conditions as something we have to add to the physics? Uh, it's also not obvious that asymptotic flatness violates general covariance. It's, it is clear that uh, asymptotically flat cosmologies don't satisfy Einstein's version of Mach's principle, but then it becomes very clear very soon after he writes this paper that basically no theory like general relativity possibly could. Uh, it's not clear how general the statistical considerations against equilibrium of island universes are. Uh, and it would be nice to have some reason, for more reason than he actually gives in the paper, to think that no other boundary conditions will do. Okay, so almost every phase of the argument is uh, a little shakier than you would like. Um, now, a number of, uh, some of you will have not only like read all these documents, but also read a number of uh, very influential and beautiful accounts of the dispute between Einstein and de Sitter um, that basically clear up almost every question you would have about this episode, except for one or two. So I think like the way I think of it is like the big game hunters have already swept through this territory, but there's still a little bit of varmint hunting uh, for people like me to do. So uh, in particular, I think people haven't really gotten to the bottom of what Einstein's on about when he talks about the need to add boundary conditions. And I also think that there's, in a sense, more to Einstein's worries about general covariance than is usually thought, including by Einstein himself a few months after this uh, paper was written. OK, so let's start with um, the boundary conditions, the need to add boundary conditions. So here's the opening paragraph of the paper. It's well known that Poisson's equation in combination with the equations of motion for a material point is not as yet a perfect substitute for Newton's theory of action at a distance. There still need to be taken into account boundary conditions on the gravitational potential. There's an analogous state of things in the theory of gravitation and general relativity. Here, too, we must supplement the differential equations by limiting conditions at infinity uh, if we want to regard the universe as being <coughs> spatially infinite. All right, so here's Weil's reaction to this, ju writing just a couple of years later in his influential book on relativity. Just as in the Newtonian theory of gravity, the law of continuous action expressed in Poisson's equation entails the Newtonian laws of attraction only if the condition that the potential vanishes at infinity is superimposed. So Einstein, in his theory, seeks to supplement the differential equations by introducing boundary conditions at spatial infinity. To overcome the difficulty of formulating conditions of a generally covariant character, he finds himself constrained to assume that the world is closed with respect uh, to space. For in that case, boundary conditions are, absence, are absent. In consequence of the above remarks, I'll say in a second what they are, the author, i.e. Weil, cannot admit the cogency of this deduction. Since the differential equations themselves, without boundary conditions, contain the physical laws of nature in an unabbreviated form, excluding every ambiguity. Okay, so Weil clearly has this picture that Einstein thinks he needs to complete the theory by adding the boundary conditions because the differential equations on their own contain some kind of ambiguity. And we'll see in a moment why Weil might think that, even though it's not in the original paper. Okay, what considerations does Weil have in mind? Well. In the paragraph above, he's basically uh, given a sort of hand-waving argument that the initial value problem for the theory should be well posed, and in particular that the state of a point here should just depend on uh, the state on that part of a Cauchy surface in the past that's in the past light cone of that, that point. So he thinks, look, um, we see that the differential equations of the, of the field equations of the field contain the physical laws of nature in their complete form, and that there cannot be a further limitation due to boundary conditions at spatial infinity, for instance. He said, what's Weil's picture here is Einstein, in saying that the field equations need to have boundary conditions added to them in order to complete the physics, is just confused about the kind of differential equations he's dealing with. Carlo, you're going to defend Einstein? Isn't Vile doing that? 
Um, so it's not totally clear what Vial's doing here because he doesn't, uh, he actually only sort of talks about the initial value problem in a, a local way. He doesn't worry about a state on an entire Cauchy surface. Um, so I agree it's not totally clear what Vial is doing or that he has the, the mathematical high ground here. Um, one of the reasons I wanted to include this is just to, I mean, to, to make it clear that it's not, it's not just me who's worried about this opening move. Um, and it's not sort of reading back some contemporary way of thinking of differential equations into Einstein that gets me worried about this. I mean, Einstein's closest friends and admirers and mathematical gurus were worried about this. Okay. So, I mean, Weil is essentially saying, like, look, Einstein doesn't realize it's really a hyperbolic equation. And so that rather than talking about uh, imposing uh, constraints on a sort of compact set in space-time, he should be worrying and, and trying to use that to solve the field inside. Um, you might think of what Einstein says about the whole argument here as evidence that he is sort of thinking that way. Rather than thinking that way, he should be thinking about an initial uh, value problem because it's a hyperbolic equation like Maxwell's equation, say. Um, so from Weil's point of view, Einstein's problem here is he's talking about Poisson's equation, which does have this feature that in order to fix the solution in the interior, you've got to fix the state of the field on the boundary. That's sort of what you do. Right? He should be talking about Maxwell's equation, where in order to fix the state elsewhere, you fix the state on an initial data slice. And Weil seems to have this picture. He's trying to be polite, but Einstein just is confused about the kind of differential equation he's working with. And so, you know, he's totally misled by this analogy with Poisson. Okay. And there's at least some tem tenuous evidence that something like this is going on. I mean, of course, Einstein's well aware of the analogy between his field equations and Maxwell's equations. And yet, when he's writing to Ehrenfest, uh, you know, immediately after writing down the final form of the field equations to brag about his achievement, what he says is, I've generalized Poisson's equation. Um, and then in a slightly earlier period, he's writing to Hertz, um, and he essentially says, like, look, I know with uh, an elliptic equation like Laplace's equation, uh, I've got to fix the, the field on the boundary in order to get it in the interior. And I know that doesn't work for a hyperbolic equation like the wave equation. So what on earth is going to happen in general relativity? Right? As if he just hasn't assimilated this uh, fact that it's initial value problems that are appropriate when you're dealing with equations of this type. Okay, oh, and then the final thing he says is, now then, uh, how does it look for the complicated transformation conditions of the general theory of relativity? I'm stuck there like a bewildered ox. Okay, so file has this bewildered ox theory. Um, and I, you know, I think I'm also going to come up with a story about what Einstein's up here that attributes to him some kind of error, but it's going to be less gross uh, than the one uh, Weil attributes to him. So here's another letter from Einstein, or sorry, here's a letter from Einstein uh, to this character, Furster, who's an engineer at the Krupp's works. Um, this is uh, later in the year after he published the paper. And he basically here is like expanding on the train of thought from that first paragraph that we've been talking about. So uh, Furster has said, look, it looks to me like there's more than one vacuum solution for your field equations. And I don't know whether Einstein's aware of that or not in advance, but what he says is, oh, we, don't, we shouldn't be surprised about that, um, that you could get something other than Minkowski uh, space-time as a solution to the vacuum equations um, because... Uh, you know, that's what you get. You get multiple solutions if you don't fit the, fix the boundary conditions. It's analogous for Newton. As long as the behavior of the potential at infinity hasn't been laid down, then uh, you might get a non-zero potential even if there's no matter. Right? So um, as a solution, we might have phi equals xy, even though rho, the density of matter, is everywhere zero. It's just this situation that forces me to consider boundary conditions as I do not want to admit a disturbing ambiguity. Okay, so here we again find the ambiguity way of talking, uh, which wasn't in print, but seems to have somehow gotten around to file. Okay, so here's this point, right? So suppose we have some matter with density rho subject to forces given by a potential phi. Uh, we know uh, it's 
it deserves to be called a potential because the motion of the matter obey Newton's second law for that potential. And uh, the potential obeys Poisson's equation. So you put the mass density on the right and you look for a solution uh, of that condition on the left. Does that mean that uh, the physics you have obeys Newton's law of gravity? Einstein says, uh, well, of course, yes, if phi is the real Newtonian potential, right? The one that you get calculate by basically putting a point mass everywhere uh, and then weighting them by rho and integrating the way you'd expect. But no, if phi is some other non-Newtonian potential, because then ma matter is going to obey some weirdo force law. Right? It's obeying the second law. It's obeying Poisson's equation, it's, but it's obeying a non-Newtonian force law. Um, and further thought, no matter what phi is, there will be uh, non-Newtonian, sorry, no matter what rho is, there'll be non-Newtonian phi's that satisfy those two equations. So you've really got to put in the boundary conditions if you want to fix the physics. Like he says in the opening paragraph, like, you haven't got Newton's law back and if you've just done the first two things without also doing the third one. Okay, now consider the way the Newtonian approximation is presented in textbooks today. So you're going to work in the weak field approximation. So um, you're going to consider a pair consisting of uh, a perturbation of the Minkowski metric and uh, a matter density that satisfy the linearized equations for dust. You're going to throw away, you're going to treat HAB as a first order perturbation and throw away all higher order terms. You're going to work in the quasi-static regime, so you're going to assume that HAB is basically constant in time for the part of space-time you're concerned with. And you're going to suppose that matter has small velocities, so the world lines of the dust particles are all orthogonal to some uh, space-like hypersurface, the background Minkowski metric. Then to a good approximation, you get versions of Poisson's equation and Newton's second law, in which the quantity minus a half H00, the time component of the, perturb the perturbation to the metric, plays the role of the potential. Okay, so that's, that's the derivation that almost every book leads you through. And then they almost always stop without worrying about whether that quantity is a Newtonian potential or a non-Newtonian potential for that mass distribution. Important exception, Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler add some boundary conditions to take care of this final ambiguity. Okay, that's how it's done in textbooks. Look how it's done in Einstein's canonical presentation of 1916. take as input to the discussion uh, the assumptions that we're going to work in the linear approximation, we're going to deal with a quasi-static perturbation, we're going to have approximately stationary dust, and he goes on to add another assumption. The assumption that uh, the perturbation uh, of the Minkowski metric goes to zero at spatial infinity. It's right? something that isn't used in contemporary discussions. And as output, he gets Poisson's equation and Newton's second law uh, with a time-time component of AKB playing the role of potential. And then he stops. I'm done, he says. Okay, so question, why does he add that extra assumption that the pertur perturbation is asymptotically flat at spatial infinity that modern textbooks don't use and that he doesn't use in his discussion? And when you think about the project you're engaged in here, it doesn't immediately seem like it's that useful, right? Because you're trying to show basically that a certain relation holds at every point of space-time. Knowing uh, normally, you impose something like asymptotic flatness when you want to show, okay, some physical stuff holds out here, in there, who knows what's going on. That's not the kind of project here. It's crucial to the kind of project he's engaged in to get the right physics in the center where the matter is. Okay. So here's the hopeful conjecture. Um, he adds asymptotic flatness at spatial infinity because he wants to guarantee that this thing that's playing the role of the gravitational potential is really the Newtonian potential for the matter distribution he's talking about. Okay, so he says that in imposing asymptotic flatness, we restrict attention to gravitational fields, which may be regarded as generated exclusively by matter in a finite region. And then there's something he doesn't say, perhaps because it cons he considers it too obvious. This means uh, that rho has compact support, so phi n will be the unique solution of Poisson's equations that goes to zero at spatial infinity. But, but we're re requiring that HAB is asymptotically flat, He's guaranteed that minus h0, 0, minus a half h0, 0 itself is a solution of Poisson's equation that goes to zero at spatial infinity, so it must be the Newtonian potential. Okay. So that's the picture. 
of what's going on in this opening paragraph of the paper. Suppose you're worried that there are perturbations of HAB of the Minkowski metric that satisfy the assumptions of the ordinary Newtonian approximation, but in which particles end up obeying a non-Newtonian force law. And suppose you know that such perturbations can be ruled out by imposing asymptotic flatness. Then it would be reasonable for you to say the thing he says in the opening paragraph. Um, now, is there really a disturbing ambiguity there? Um, is, you know, if he hadn't imposed the asymptotic flatness, is it really possible that we could have ended up with a non-Newtonian non behavior of the dust in uh, the Newtonian approximation? Uh, and the answer is no, not for the cases Einstein's concerned with. Right? Because when you look more at the cosmology paper, he clearly thinks that uh, Poisson's equation only really makes physical sense when uh, rho goes to zero at spatial infinity. And as long as rho goes to zero sufficiently fast, um, you're guaranteed, again, by other, another route that uh, minus a half H00 will be the Newtonian potential. Basically because the difference between whatever the real Newtonian potential is and H00 is going to have to satisfy Laplace's equation and be bounded. And there's only, uh, the only way you can be a bounded function satisfying Laplace's equation is to be constant. So H00 and uh, the other guy will give you the same motions. Okay, so in the end, I want to attribute a sort of error uh, to Einstein in thinking that he needed this assumption of asymptotic flatness, uh, but not as crazy an error, I think, as uh, the thing that's being assigned to him by Weil. And if you look at what happens next in this story, um, the next time he comes around to talk, give an extensive discussion of the Newtonian approximation in the Princeton lectures, you get a completely different picture in which he doesn't employ asymptotic flatness. And instead, he basically uh, follows De Sitter's suggestion to work in uh, harmonic coordinates and uh, just sets uh, H00 equal to the Newtonian potential using uh, standard retarded potential kind of way of proceeding, which is just to basically put in by, uh, impose by fiat the assumption that um, we're restricting attention to the Newtonian potential. But I think it's interesting that asymptotic flatness is just completely dropped out as if he has noticed that it wasn't doing any work there in the first place. Okay, so that was one half of the story. How long was that, Leos? About 20 minutes? Yes. Ah, good, okay. All right, second half of the story. Um, asymptotic flatness and general covariance. So uh, there's this famous reply to Kretschmann of 1918, in which Einstein for the, you know, distinguishes three fundamental aspects of the theory, he calls them, which he says by no means are independent. <laughs> And he also adds, interestingly, that until now he's failed to clearly distinguish between the first and the third. The first one is that what he's calling the principle of relativity, uh, we might call it the principle of general covariance instead. Uh, nature's laws are merely statements about temporal, space temporal spatial coincidences, okay, that doesn't seem so productive yet. Therefore, they find their only natural expression in generally covariant equations. Uh, principle of relativity, principle of equivalence, Inertia and gravitational mass are identical. And what he's now calling Mach's principle, the G field, the metric, is completely determined by the masses of the bodies. Okay? And it, when you look at his correspondence, even like a month before this paper is published, you can see that he really is running together A and C under the name of the principle of relativity. Okay, so here are two things that he says are bad about imposing asymptotic flatness, adding asymptotic flatness to the field equations to complete the physics. The first one, comes from the cosmology paper, and the second one comes from a letter uh, to me written about a, uh, a year later. In both of them, we get the same two complaints. In the first place, those boundary conditions presuppose a definite choice of a system of reference, which is contrary to the spirit of, relativi the, spirit of the relativity principle in its general covariance uh, guise. Secondly, if we adopt this new view, we fail to comply with the requirement of the relativity of inertia. Inertia would indeed be influenced uh, by, but would not be conditioned by, matter. Okay, so now the problem is with Mach's principle. So think of the Schwarzschild solution. I mean, as you go further and further away from the central mass, it looks more and more like Minkowski spacetime. And so Einstein's thinking like, okay, the central mass is playing basically no role in determining which trajectories are inertial far away, right? There's something else that's doing that. That's a violation of Mach's principle. 
Okay, from the letter to me. Uh, and this picks up on the theme of consistency. I must know whether what I interpret as the relativity principle can be thought through without encountering contradictions. For this, it is necessary that the gravitational field be entirely determined by matter, which, however, is not true for the quasi-Euclidean world, i.e., in asymptotically flat spacetimes. Its boundary conditions at infinity are not covariant under arbitrary transformations, i.e., not relativistic. The inertial phenomena and metric properties of the spacetime continuum are basically determined by these non-relativistic boundary conditions, not by bodies, basically conditioned by, right? As you go further and further away, it's the matter. It just isn't calling the shots anymore. Okay, so there's these two problems, right? Violation of general covariance, violation of Mach's principle. So, I mean, Mach's principle didn't last very long at all after this in Einstein's mind. Um, so, uh, I mean, here's, here's his prettiest statement of it from uh, a letter to Schwarzschild. So this is, they're discussing the Schwarzschild solution, and it seems like Schwarzschild has asked him, like, what's with this uh, uh, assumption of asymptotic flatness that we're both using? Are we serious about it? And Einstein's like, no, no, it's not serious at all. Um, uh, then he goes on to say that in his dream theory, matter will completely determine the inertial trajectories. It can be put jokingly this way. If I allow all things to vanish from the world, then following Newton, the Galilean inertial space remains. Following my interpretation, nothing remains. Right? So uh, he's saying in a good theory, there should be no vacuum solutions. And indeed, in uh, the reply to Kretschmann, he says this explicitly, like, We've got to get rid of the old field equations because they have a vacuum solution, namely Minkowski spacetime. They physically can't be right. We've got to replace them by solutions that have no vacuum solutions. Okay. But as De Sitter pointed out at about the same time, although it took Einstein a little while to accept this, uh, if you modify the field equations as Einstein proposed by adding a positive cosmological constant term, there are still going to be vacuum solutions, uh, namely De Sitter spacetime. Uh, and that's something that Einstein eventually accepted, and it caused him to rethink the status of Mach's principle. Okay. That stuff is just in there mostly to, because we'll need some of it later when we talk more about general covariance. Um, so here's a s switching topics to the, um, the complaint that asymptotic flatness at spatial infinity, that imposing that violates general covariance. Here's another letter to me. These letters, to me, are great because uh, although Einstein finds them annoying and doesn't really want to answer his questions, the questions that he's being asked are so good that uh, occasionally you find a lot of stuff out. Okay, so I don't believe that the boundary conditions, flatness at spatial infinity, apply in principle. Okay, so he, he grants that they're really useful for talking about subsystems of the universe. Right? So, of course, he himself uses them for analyzing the motion of Mercury. He uses them in the gravitational waves papers. Uh, he thinks they're right when you're talking about smallish, medium-sized things. Okay. Uh, I don't believe the boundary conditions apply in principle, i.e. to the entire universe. If this were the case, my entire theory would have to be rejected. A theory generally invariant with regard to differential equations regarding arbitrary substitutions, but not generally invariant with regard to boundary conditions, is a monstrosity. Okay. So any, any relative of general relativity in which boundary conditions are imposed is a monstrosity. Keep that in mind for later. If the, if the asymptotic flatness boundary conditions fall away, then all the essential grounds for the preference of one specific choice regarding the coordinate systems of rotational motion also fall away. And so here you get the picture like, what's, what's really bad uh, about imposing asymptotic flatness is you've got a preferred standard of rotation at spatial infinity. That's what's unphysical. Uh, but you get rid of that by uh, getting rid of the boundary conditions. And that becomes completely clear when you move to a spatially compact cosmology. For then the spatial boundary conditions are eliminated. So that for any choice of coordinates, the events of the world as a whole are determined entirely by the differential equations of al alone. So, whoa, we, do, we no longer have to, I mean, obviously, yeah, we no longer have to impose the boundary conditions as well as the differential equations to complete the physics. Okay, so... There's a couple of worries you might have about this discussion of Einstein's. One is that a double standard is being employed. Right? So, uh, I mean, think of how he describes his own preferred cosmology in a letter to Ehrenfest. So Einstein's own preferred cosmology is basically a cylinder. Right? Um, it's got absolute time. The horizontal slices of the cylinder are preferred spatial slices picked out by the geometry. He writes to Ehrenfest, sort of triumphant about this uh, new cosmology. 
And then he says, the odd thing is that now a quasi-absolute time and preferred coordinate system do reappear in the end while fully complying with all the requirements of relativity. Right? So why is it OK in the Einstein static universe, but it's not OK in asymptotically flat solutions to have uh, preferred families of coordinates? Okay, so there's an obvious reply on Einstein's behalf here. Um, there's a real distinction for him between the case of the static universe and the case of an asymptotically flat solution, namely, in one but not the other, the preferred coordinates reflect observable material causes. Okay, so this is a theme that comes up in a letter to uh, Lawrence uh, of January 1915, so before the formulation of the final theory, uh, but it's repeated in 1922 in this uh, reply to Seleti, um, that you know, people are, seem to be constantly asking him, like, what do you mean it's generally covariant? There's like special coordinates in this solution or that solution. And, he sort of har harps on two themes. One is, well, the laws are generally covariant. Right? And the other one is, yeah, special coordinates are OK so long as they're reflecting the structure of matter. Um, but they're not OK if they're reflecting the structure of space, something non-material. OK, so that was one worry you might have about this concern of Einstein's about general covariance. Here's another one you might have. Well, look. I can come up with ways of imposing asymptotic flatness at spatial infinity that are generally covariant. And so uh, here's a clunky way to impose asymptotic flatness. You say, I'm interested in solutions on R4. There's a background non-physical Minkowski metric. And I restrict attentions to the vacuum field equations that uh, are well behaved as you go out in spatial directions of the background metric in the sense that the solutions approach more and more closely the Minkowski metric. So it's a clunky way of imposing asymptotic flatness. Here's another clunky way of doing it. Restrict attentions to solutions on R4 vacuum equations uh, that approach some flat Minkowski metric or other, not a fixed one, suitably quickly in suitable, suitably, suitable directions. So the second approach is generally covariant, fully generally covariant. The space of solutions is closed under the action of the full space-time diffeomorphism group, whereas the first one isn't fully generally covariant. It's course closed under the action of compactly supported diffeomorphisms, but not under full ones. And so there are ways, uh, generally covariant ways, of imposing asymptotic flatness at spatial infinity. And Einstein is aware, uh, eventually, of this kind of point. Uh, and I think he concedes more ground than he should when he's talking about it. So he's writing to Weil. And he says, the naturalness of the world's spatial closure can probably best be demonstrated this way. The boundary conditions must also be expressed covariantly in keeping with the nature of the thing. The differential equations Riemann tensor equals zero at infinity must take the place of the conditions metric equals constant at infinity. These are, okay, so he's basically saying, oh yeah, now I see there is a generally covariant way to impose asymptotic flatness. And then he says, these are evidently far less natural than the closure conditions. Okay, so the original reason for thinking that you couldn't have asymptotic flatness imposed at spatial infinity was uh, it's not generally covariant, so it's totally unphysical. The new reason is, well, it's not quite as good as this other way of going. Okay, so he's shifted his ground quite a bit. Um, that's what he says. I think there are other things he could have said that would have been completely in keeping with other things he says in this period. So, you might think if you're Einstein, the real point about general covariance is, this is, and this is implicit in many things he writes during this period over a period of five or six years, the better sort of theory is generally covariant in its most perspicuous formulation. So he eventually becomes aware that a lot of theories can be written down in generally covariant form. He still thinks general relativity is really special because it's the kind of theory that looks natural when written in generally covariant form, whereas the other ones have a, enjoy a sort of fake general covariance. So what we're looking for is theories that are naturally gen generally covariant. Okay, and the thought behind this, this is a little more, uh, uh, less closely tied to the text, let's say, but it seems clear to me that the thought behind this is something like, to posit a theory whose laws are tied to preferred coordinates is to posit that some sort of solution independent structure is privileging those coordinates. And that's to have re uh, recourse to what he calls in his famous uh, presentation of the theory merely factitious causes, like Newton's absolute space. Okay. So um, there's a, um, 
another theme that's running through his correspondence in this period, which is the great thing about the new theory is it finally puts the stake through the heart of space and time. They're destroyed utterly. Um, partially destroyed by special relativity, now finally destroyed. Uh, when he writes to Schlick to make this point, he says, the new finding is the result that the theory exists that agrees with all previous experience and whose equations, equations are covariant with respect to arbitrary, uh, arbitrary transformations in the space-time variables. Thus, space and time lose the last vestiges of physical reality. Right? There's this thought that um, to be generally covariant is to, in your natural formulation, is to get rid of space and time. Why? Because if you fail to be generally covariant, it must be because there's some background structure in there that's ruining general covariance. And what could it be? It's solution independent. It's got to be something like space and time. OK. So now, this is like what I think he could have said instead of conceding as much as he did to Hall. Right? Think about the cosmological sector of general relativity. Well, there, so spatially compact. Well, that is a genuinely generally covariant theory in Einstein's sense. In its most perspicuous formulation, it's generally covariant. There is no physically motivated solution independent way of factoring the group of space-time diffeomorphisms into gauge and physical, right? which is what you'd have to do if you're going to find an interesting non-generally covariant formulation. I, I can say more about what I mean here, but let's, let's keep going. But if we look at the asymptotically flat sector, things are different. So. There's the fakely generally covariant one, but let's throw that away and focus on the one where you've broken general covariance by in putting in something like preferred frames at spatial infinity. Here, there's an interesting physically motivated solution independent way of factoring space-time diffeomorphisms into physical and gauge. Right? The gauge ones are the ones, the diffeomorphisms that are asymptotic to the identity at spatial infinity. And the physical ones are equivalence classes of those ones that correspond to transformations, Poincaré transformations at spatial infinity. So what you do is you find the asymptotically trivial ones, you factor them out. You get a space of solutions modulo gauge symmetries. <coughs> the original action of the space-time diffeomorphism group projects down to that space to give you an action of the Poincaré group. And um, so all this is being done in a very, <coughs> uh, very geometric and fairly well-motivated way. And what you end up with is something that looks just like you would expect uh, the action of the Poincaré group to look like, namely something that's related in the normal way to conserved quantities. So for instance, um, asympto asymptotic time translations at spatial infinity correspond to the ADM energy. So you get the normal relation between conserved quantities and uh, symmetries. Okay, so this is a real disanalogy between the uh, spatially compact case and the asymptotically flat case. A disanalogy that is driven by the fact that you're putting in extra structure uh, in the asymptotically flat case in a way that Einstein should find objectionable. So I think he had it right the first time by his lights. Asymptotic boundary conditions violate general covariance, and it's a sign that a lot of extra interesting structure, preferred frames, approximate symmetries, conserved quantities, shared by solutions, uh, a lot of extra structure is shared by solutions satisfying the same boundary conditions. Okay, so I don't think you should have given up uh, on this claim about uh, why it's bad to impose asymptotic flatness from the point of view of the physical content of the principle of general covariance. But that's not the end of the story. There's one more chapter. So to center space-time is like Einstein's nemesis in this period. So uh, recall what to center space-time looks like. It's, uh, it looks like this. Um, so you can t picture it as start with Minkowski space-time, pick a point, look at all the points that lie at one unit of uh, space-like distance from that given point. That will give you a sort of hyperboloid. Okay. If we're, you could slice it into these horizontal slices, then you get something like space is always a sphere that starts out arbitrarily large at negative values of t, shrinks, and then re-expands. Uh, there are other ways of slicing it, though, that uh, makes more obvious something that that way 
hides, namely that this, this space-time is homogeneous. So uh, you must have put in some extra content in order to make it look like it was changing because in itself it's not changing. Okay, so that's Desitter space-time. Um, so first way in which Desitter space-time is monstrous by Einstein's lights. Well, he famously hoped, like we talked about before, that in his new field equations, there'd be no vacuum solutions. So the idea seemed to be that since they required no spatial boundary conditions in the cosmological setting, they must embody Mach's principle. And so there would be no space-time if there were no matter. Uh, but to consider space-time as a counterexample, it's a vacuum solution to the, uh, the new field equations, something that Einstein was reluctantly forced to accept. It's the first sense in which to consider space-time is monstrous. Second sense. So Einstein took his own static universe to provide a good approximation to physical reality, good enough uh, to provide a guide to the large-scale structure of the universe. So he says this explicitly in another letter to me. Right? So me and de Sitter are constantly complaining about uh, all the idealizations that Einstein makes when he sets up his cosmology. Like, they're not sure uh, the cosmos is static, and they're sure it's not spatially homogeneous. Einstein's like, no, look, it's close enough that we can read off uh, facts about the large-scale structure of our universe by looking at the behavior of this thing. And the behavior of this thing is it never changes. Okay. Further, he and Weil took De Sitter's uh, solution to be doubly incapable of cosmological representation. Uh, their first objection is uh, the cosmos is obviously static, so if you've got a solution that's supposed to re represent a be useful for cosmological representation, then there must be some static slicing of it. But there's no decent static slicing of de Sitter space-time. When you look at the obvious static slicing, you find that the instants of time are crossing and that they don't cover the whole space-time. So that's no good. Um, so basically the problem is, the, 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 it is, it is space-time homogeneous. It always looks the same at every point, but somehow you can't parlay that into, ah, yes, there's space that's maintaining its form and not changing. That's, they thought that was too bogus. Uh, and then they had another objection, which I can't quite understand. Um, they don't explain it. This is from a letter that Weil is writing to Klein, uh, but he says, oh, Einstein's sitting here, and we just agreed this is what we should say. The problem with De Sitter is it's separated by an abyss from any static solution of the same topology. I'd be interested to hear if people think they are, uh, know exactly what these guys meant by that. OK, so that's what Einstein thinks, right? That's, that's what's bad about De Sitter. OK, but here's the problem. Lemaitre and Eddington pointed out that Einstein's cosmology was unstable. Okay, so if you take uh, a state, so basically what's going on with the cosmological constant? It's put in there to balance the attraction of gravitation, right? If you have a matter-filled universe like Einstein's static universe, you might expect it to shrink right? because the matter should be getting closer together because of gravity. But the point of the cosmological constant is that it drives matter away from itself. If you precisely balance it, then you get something that's static. But of course, if you slightly disturb the balance, then one or the other of these two forces takes over. In particular, if you slightly if you start out with Einstein's static universe and you slightly decrease the mass density at an instant, then what happens is the cosmological constant takes over and you get something whose future looks more and more like the Sitter spacetime, whose past looks more and more like Einstein's static universe. So, um, so, you, <laughs> so you end up, uh, yeah, it's basically you can't read off the large, there's no way to read off the large-scale structure of space-time from Einstein's static universe because things that are arbitrarily similar to Einstein's static universe at a time are incredibly different in the, in the future. Right. Second sense in which, Einstein, in which De Sitter space-time is monstrous for Einstein. Third and final sense. So initial data is similar to Einstein's, initial data in Einstein's universe, and initial data similar to De Sitter's universe, both lead to universes that are like De Sitter's universe in the future. You don't have to be exactly like either of them for that to happen. But it turns out they're not special. 
when you have a positive cosmological constant, vast region, vast regions in the space of solutions are asymptotically de Sitter. So de Sitter is like a very powerful attractor for the dynamics of general relativity. So at least roughly speaking, the lambda greater than zero field equations, Einstein's new field equations, come with uh, dynamically enforced asymptotic boundary conditions. Normal space times are at least locally asymptotically de Sitter and so have certain uh, uh, conserved quantities and so on, asymptotic symmetries uh, at a space like, uh, a future space like infinity. So in a sense, the sector of the theory exhibits background independence, right? Um, sorry, it violates background independence because there are ways of setting up the theory that make explicit the fact that solutions share all kinds of solution independent structure at future space like infinity. But contrary to Einstein's picture, this background structure is implied by the dynamical laws rather than uh, being an exogenous constraint on them. Right? So you get this picture that you're getting a failure of background independence, not because there's something like space being put in by hand, but because the dynamics is forcing it, the dynamics that he wrote down. OK, so we get these three ways in which to consider space time is monstrous. It's an unexpected outcome of the new field equation. So it's like this monster hiding in the room uh, that he was showing everybody. He'll come in here, it's great. And then uh, it turned out there's this horrible thing in there. Uh, the it's also the unexpected future fate of solutions close to Einstein's static universe. So it's like this horrible monster that like bursts out of uh, his, favorite, uh, his favorite friend. Also, uh, models, it, uh, de Sitter space-time models the future of normal solutions to the, field equation, uh, to the new field equations. So asymptotic boundary conditions are dynamically emergent rather than the reflecting background structure imposed out ab initio. And so the connection that Einstein so cherished between general covariance and background independence is severed. All right. Thanks very much. Ah, uh, yes. I'm searching it in the books. Yeah, so it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's note three to document 567, I'm volume eight. Thank you. Um, my question is to the third sense of monstrosity. Can you go to that slide? Oh, no, sorry, those were forbidden slides. Ah. No, the, uh, the third want, sense of it being one. Uh, uh, well, it's at the bottom, but you want I, me to go further? Yeah. So um, maybe that just went a bit fast for me. I just wasn't sure why um, that should be seen as a manifestation of background dependence. I mean, why, why that should... Well, it's and, background dependent in the sense that, I mean, it... it In the sense that um, solutions share a lot of geometrical background structure. In that sense, it's background dependence. So in um, ge ge where does ge the background Geometry come in? at infinity. OK, so they share, the, sh the solutions share that they look similar uh, at infinity. But yeah, in what so sense? they have the same kinds of asymptotic symmetries, and so there's the same kinds of uh, conserved quantities. But uh, where does that count as background? Well, I mean, that's a matter of stipulation. I mean, uh, uh, I have a stipulation uh, about what background uh, independence is. Background independence is when um, uh, you don't have things that you're tempted to count as physically distinct that have the same geometry. So what makes ordinary physics in Minkowski space-time background dependent? Well, we you know, act on a solution by a Poincaré symmetry, you get a new solution, same geometry, but there's at least some temptation to say, oh, there's two physically distinct situations there. Okay. Okay, and in this kind of, when you impose asymptotic boundary conditions, you can act on a solution by uh, an asymptotically non-trivial symmetry, and it's at least coherent to say, ah, now I've got a, a, a distinct solution, uh, physically distinct solution with the same geometry. Yeah. Okay. Okay, then I get it in what sense this counts as background dependent. I think... Just, um, yeah. so that's... We can, so, I mean, background dependence is a little bit of a red herring here. I mean, we could, it's sort of playing a, 
is sort of intermediating between the notion of general covariance and the thing Einstein cares about it, which is like, are you putting space in? Yeah, that, that's exactly what I was about to say. I think right. one has to be careful there to say background, background independence or background dependence in that sense is not something that occurs exactly like that in Einstein, right? And so it's- Right, right, no, no, he's not interested. Uh, the, right, so the, yeah. the, right, that's a modern gloss. Yeah. Um, so put it in his terms, right? Like, so general covariance is broken. So there must be some vestige of an absolute space and time in there. Yeah. Um, okay, but it's much more tempting to say that about asymptotic flatness at spatial infinity or asymptotically anti-de-sitter space times than it is about asymptotically de-sitter where you feel like, oh, I didn't put it in, I didn't cheat. Your equations did it. Yeah. I, I think that's very interesting. So you, you, in, you link the modern notion or a modern notion of background independence and situate it into, you know, somewhere in the middle of historical options. I think that's great. I think. A question and uh, maybe a comment, depending on your solution. The question is very simple. First time Einstein encountered the De Sitter solution, uh, was it in, in the form that space looked compact or in the form that space looked uh, non-compact? Yeah, I, so, uh, I suppose they, it was yeah. not clear that you could do either. Yeah, so they, um, I mean, somebody else here probably knows this much better than I do. My recollection is De Sitter originally says, oh, we're going to look at a hyperboloid. And then they start exchanging letters with each other and to a certain extent with Weil and Klein, and they consider a lot of different forms, including uh, the ones where space is Euclidean. Uh, but, and then it, it just takes them forever. It t basically, it takes Klein to say, no, no, look, remember the hyperboloid thing. Um, uh, it's not singular, which is the thing that they're fighting about. Um, yeah, so, you, so it's not clear if Einstein, in, in his first encounter to it, he was th thinking that space is compact or not in the solution. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. So the, the I, question is not what it is. The question is what, how Einstein saw it. Yeah, first. okay, good, good. Yeah, so I mean, so he, he had already published his paper before this came up, right? So, uh, I mean, to consider space time as a reaction to Einstein's claim that the new field equations won't have a vacuum solution. Um, I think De Sitter originally thinks and presents it to Einstein as uh, a spatially compact a spatially vacuum compact. solution. Okay. But in the subsequent correspondence, many, many things get confused. And I think one of the things they, I think they do consider representations in, in which part of De Sitter's space time is covered by spatially open slices. I see. So it, this rules out the possibility that part of the, um, and happiness of Einstein it was simply the fact that there was an infinity at all, a spatial yeah. infinity at all. Right, right. So he, um, yeah, so that, that letter from, to Klein that I was quoting from where he says, yeah. uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's well. okay, I admit it, it is a vacuum solution, but it's no good because it's not static. Um, that letter is when he finally gets what the picture looks like. Uh. So he knows that, that he's not worried at that point about slicings where you go to sort of future infinity along Euclidean slices. Okay. Because uh, I had a sense that he had a prejudice for closed spaces, which I mean, might yeah. be motivated by deep gap feelings and the 2000 year of discussion of the issue before that was sort of beyond his, some yeah. of his faith. Yeah. I mean, I think, I, yeah, I, I, I think that might be right. I mean, and in, in this case, he, you know, he, he, he thought he saw all kinds of ways of getting out of the counterexample. Um, uh, and the ones that caused most confusion were that he and Weil were convinced that there was actually matter in Sitter space time because of coordinate singularities in some of the representations they used. Uh, thanks for that. I I think it's, uh, it's a fantastic, uh, it's on. I think it's on. I mean, I, I really uh, appreciate the, to me, this puts all this in quite a new perspective. Um, I just wanted to point out as, as a historical matter that uh, from Eddington, almost from the very beginning, you get a completely different view of the same problem, not yeah. put in terms of background independence, but in talking about something that I, I think is essentially equivalent, namely that what's distinctive about the theory is not uh, the existence or non-existence of, say, inertial frames at, at infinity, 
but the fact that they're not imposed by the theory in advance, they're not pre presupposed by the theory. So space-time has some characteristics in virtue of which, just as a contingent matter, as, uh, as a question of uh, the distribution of matter and energy, it might be possible to impose coordinates over a finite area, but the theory doesn't presuppose that. It might be a fact about space-time, but it's just a, a contingent empirical matter. And the theory is, again, these aren't uh, Eddington's words, it's background independent in, in the sense that it doesn't presuppose a space-time background, but allows that to emerge from empirical conditions. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think Eddington's discussion of, uh, you know, like whatever it's called, off to infinity or something in his popular book is, is tremendous. Uh, uh, partly for its insight into his, his like diagnosis of what's going on in Einstein. So he can, I think he sees long before Einstein does that, um, you know, Einstein's form of Mox principle is this really weird prejudice in favor of uh, like rocks and uh, stones and against uh, fields. Um, and he thinks, he says something like, well, I come from the land of Faraday and Maxwell. Like, I think the field's great. So I'm not worried at all about that. And then he, says all these interesting things that you were alluding to. And there's a letter from Einstein to Lawrence later in which Einstein says, like, oh, I just read this book. I think it's really good. I don't agree with what he says about boundary conditions. I wonder what you'll say. Uh, I, I just one thing I wanted to add, which is that he actually already talks this way in the, the report in on the, the report, relativity yeah, theory. Right, right, right. Yeah, no, I mean, I, yeah, I think, I mean, yeah. Eddington's early thoughts about general covariance are so clear and interesting. It's, it's really amazing. Um. Well, I think that wraps it up for this morning. Let's thank Gordon once again. <laughs>